first question is, how has education in Michigan changed during your time on the school board? Let's start there. Well, I spent 14 years on the school board. I think it was 93 when I first came on. It was just before Proposal A passed, which changed our entire funding structure for Michigan public education, so that was huge. Uh, we had been relying on property taxes, locally voted, to run local schools. And in Berrien Springs, we were having a hard time passing a millage to keep our schools going. In fact, they were so low on finances that they were cutting busing and sports and the entire school board basically resigned or was recalled. Uh, so th we have a lot of parochial interests in Berrien Springs. We have an Adventist University, we have Lutheran schools, and, and then we had the public schools. And to try to get a vote all the time for millages to support the schools was difficult sometimes. So Proposal A changed everything. Now property taxes were lowered, but everything kind of goes through Lansing and comes back, and each school kind of gets a foundation grant for each student. It, it's a, a more fair and equitable system, and it relies less on locally voted property taxes. Uh, so that, that was a huge change. It helped Bering Springs, where I was board president, uh, helped give some stability to our, our financial situation. Um, but we had quite a, quite a run on our school board. We were hiring and firing administrators and changing programs. And um, all in all, over 14 years, I'm pretty proud. Uh, Bering Springs is on a good financial uh, footing these days. Uh, they've got some great leadership. They're innovative in, in technology and STEM programs. So the curriculum has changed over the years. The, demands from Lansing and from Washington, D.C. have changed. Um, schools had gone through a phase where they were phasing out career tech education programs. Now they're coming back. Uh, there's just lot, lots of changes, um, uh, lots of challenges, uh, but uh, a lot of changes too. That's exciting. Brian, can you hear his, um, oh, my his buttons back? here? Do you remember? Uh, that's not what I'm hearing now. Okay, great. I'll, I'll try to avoid that. No, you're fine. Great answer to that first question. Let's um, talk about your biggest accomplishment from 2015 to 2016. The, the, the biggest accomplishment from the 2015-16 session. Well, there's big accomplishments for the session as a whole. Um, we, we finally passed a roads package in Michigan. Uh, it wasn't ideal as far as I was concerned. I didn't really like the package, but I voted for it because we needed to do something. Uh, in the last days here of, of Lame Duck, uh, we passed an energy package, which is pretty historic. That'll set the tone for energy policy for the next decade or so in Michigan. My personal accomplishment, I think uh, one bill that passed that I pushed and sponsored and uh, promoted and finally got it through, just got it through the Senate a couple weeks ago, um, was actually related to uh, corrections. Uh, I chair the, the prison's budget in Michigan and uh, when I first was given that assignment, I received a letter across my desk signed by uh, lots of, a whole list of former corrections officials and wardens and others who we're pointing out an injustice in our criminal justice system, in, in the parole system, uh, where certain long-term prisoners, when they came up for the possibility of parole, were not being treated fairly. It's kind of a complicated issue. It was in regards to a veto power of a judge over parole hearings. And I, I guess to say it briefly, when a prisoner, one of these long term, it's a life with the possibility of parole, when they come up for the chance of parole, to have a hearing and be considered for parole, the judge who sentenced them is notified and can veto it and just end the whole process. I'm not sure they should have that right, but the, the situation that I addressed was often, this is 20, 30, 40 years after they were sentenced, they finally are coming up for the chance of a parole hearing and that judge is no longer on the bench, so there's a successor judge who doesn't know the case, didn't hear the trial, doesn't, hasn't met this prisoner. They also have the right 
to check that box and veto without explanation. And some judges were doing that and others were not. So it wasn't fair, it just kind of depended on what area of the state you were from or what judge you happened to get, whether you were gonna be, uh, have a fair chance at parole. And the letter I received said one of the really big changes they'd like to see is that successor judge veto power eliminated. So I started researching it and I found out that the judges themselves didn't want that anymore. Uh, the Michigan Judges Association uh, supported my bill to end that veto. And I looked and it had been, there had been efforts in the past to accomplish this and it never could pass the legislature. Everybody wants to be tough on crime and not appear that they're helping release prisoners early or anything like that. And I, I charged ahead, I sponsored the bill. We got great testimony from some folks uh, from U of M, from, from former, a former judge from my area came up and testified and they just blew the socks off the committees. We got it through both houses, uh, both committees in the Senate and in the House and uh, it, it passed the Senate last week I think with only one no vote and it's going to be law. So I'm really proud of that. It's going to change some people's lives. It's fascinating work. Let's talk more too about the vocational village, the educational opportunities for inmates. That's exciting also. Um, we have a new director of our corrections department in Lansing, Heidi Washington, and uh, it's exciting to work with her. One of the, her first initiatives, and, and of course I chair the budget for corrections along with Senator Pros, and so things have to come through us, but she wanted to fund this uh, program where prisoners could receive training. Prisoners who are, you know, in that last couple of years before they're going to be released, they could receive training hands-on in welding, electrical, construction, uh, auto mechanics, CNC. And we have, we had some facilities where we had warehouses with some of this equipment there and we set one up uh, uh, at the Hanlon Correctional Facility in Ionia and, and these prisoners are actually going to be able to get certified in these various uh, areas and we also house them in a separate unit so they can learn the soft skills that go along with having a job in society showing up to work on time every day with a good attitude uh, things we take for granted, but some of these prisoners have never seen a person in their family have a job. So we're housing them separate, teaching them the soft skills, getting them training in these various skills. They, they choose which one. And then when they're released, there's jobs waiting for them. Uh, certain industries are more friendly towards receiving these folks. and. And there's a demand, there's, there's a labor shortage for some of these skilled labor positions in Michigan. And we're actually funded a second program this year. We're gonna have another location with some other uh, job skills being taught. I think it's excellent. It's uh, helping prisoners to be more successful upon release. They're coming back to society. Let's give them the best chance to fit in and have success. I was going to ask you if you if it was hard for these inmates to find jobs even though they're getting this training because of their record. But you're saying s some, some industry we're targeting where they have the better chance. Uh, some industries are, are more open to the possibility and, and we're targeting that and we're targeting where you know if we know a prisoner is coming to this community and there's a need there we can kind of focus that way and we're having some success with it. I think it's going to be a great program. And I tell you, when I went and toured the first one and they brought in all the prisoners into the auditorium who were in the program, I mean, they were just unanimous in, in support. They just, they were excited. They, you felt it in the air. They, they were given an opportunity and, and they were taking full, full advantage of it. That's wonderful. You're in favor of charter schools. And let's talk about that, giving parents more choices, and talk to you about the opportunities for cyber, for cyber schools. There's all kinds of opportunities with the cyber world. Uh, the school system that I was a part of, Bering Springs, is one of the leaders in some cyber efforts for alternative education kids um, all across the state, actually. Uh, 
some, some kids learn differently. Uh, some don't need that traditional high school diploma. Uh, and, and we're taking some of these kids who might be falling through the cracks and dropping out and giving them an opportunity through alternative education. And a lot of it is, involves learning in front of a computer at their own pace and their own time. They might be there at 10 o'clock at night, but going through a program. So there, there's great opportunities cyber-wise. It's a challenge in how we fund schools. Well, do you provide the same foundation grant for cyber students as you do traditional? We're still working through some of those issues in the legislature, um, but it's, you know, the opportunities are out there uh, with the modern technology. Um, charters and choice. Uh, I like giving parents choice. Uh, to a certain extent, competition between school districts is healthy. It keeps everybody on their toes and, and you can hold each school accountable. Um, I actually oppose the idea of this unlimited charters in Michigan. I think we've gotten to a point where we have a lot of school districts competing for a few number of students, actually a shrinking number of students, and it's not always, always the best. I'd, I'd rather concentrate on every school. What, what can we do policy-wise to help teachers, once that classroom door closes, help them be more successful in educating students. It's not just enough to say, well, this school is an A and this one's a C, let's support this one. Let's raise them all so wherever any kid is going to school, they're doing better. You know, does the teacher need better training in how to teach English to young students? I think that's an area where we can. Uh, we had an early literacy bill go through this year and, and to try to help identify students who are behind in reading before grade four and, and intervene and provide special training. Uh, I, I promote efforts more towards traditional public schools and helping everyone succeed and do a better job. I, I haven't opposed charters or, or choice. They're good tools also but I, I'd like to see everybody brought up. What about the life of a teacher, though? The, str the stressors that they face in the classroom, we know that they're underpaid, and sometimes they're paid based on performance with I-STEP score. So what's your comment on that? Uh, that really kind of makes me nervous. Um, you know, each teacher has a different group of students, and sometimes a good teacher may be targeted to have some of the more challenging students. I don't, how do you how do you fairly make a teacher's compensation? You know, I guess their evaluation should come into play, but that makes me nervous. I look at Finland, and apparently, from the research, I, I'm not an expert, but they make the teaching profession so valued in their society. They don't even you have to compete to become a teacher, where in our society it's oh, I'm a teacher, you know, uh, it's, it's on a lower rung. But in Finland, it's, it's like the, only the best and brightest can become teachers, but then they give the teacher incredible freedom in how they conduct their classes, and they've got the best scores worldwide. I think we need to concentrate on the teacher themselves, on the profession, the training we give them, how we value that profession. Uh, in general, they're not greatly paid. Uh, I know in Michigan I'd, I'd like to see wages a little higher and I'd like to see them respected more and equipped better and I think you know we can do all these choice and charter things but again once that classroom door closes how can we help that teacher be successful? Good answer. Additionally thoughts on Trump's pick for uh, of Betsy DeVos for Secretary of Education? Uh, the DeVos family have been fantastic for Michigan. They're, they're philanthropists, first class. Um, I disagree philo philosophically somewhat with, with uh, their push for charters. Um, as I've said, I, my, my approach is to bring public, traditional public schools up versus just focusing on competition. But charter schools have, have uh, brought more competition. A charter school maybe can specialize a little more. We have Countryside Charter School in Benton Harbor that has more of an agricultural specialty. There are benefits. 
Uh, so far, they haven't proven to be the magic bullet for, for education. They're a piece of the puzzle. So as she leads national policy, I would hope that she would not be so strictly focused on the issues of choice and charters, but a balanced approach to making education better, helping teachers be successful, and so forth, and not focus on too narrowly on, on charters, but uh, we'll see. What legislation do you hope to work on during your 2017 term? Well, being that I'm the corrections guy in the House, you know, I will focus some on some criminal justice items. We have uh, a presumptive parole bill that, that uh, failed this year, and we had an effort towards helping medically frail prisoners be paroled to a, a nursing home type facility uh, to give them a better, uh, a more appropriate care for their their needs in a safer setting uh, it, it's so tricky there's so but the different states are moving in that direction so I'll, I'll be working on some corrections issues um, probably my number one issue from Michigan would be no fault car insurance reform um, once I cross the line from South Bend here to going to Michigan all of a sudden you're gonna pay about three times as much for your car insurance um, we've some people say it's the best situation in the world because Michigan you're, you're just you're covered for whatever injury you have in an accident you're covered for a lifetime unlimited benefits and we have some of the best brain trauma centers in the world as a result others say well I've got to pay hundred and sixty dollars a year for every one of my vehicles additional in car insurance and that's too too high a price to pay and for some of the families in my district we're not a real wealthy district uh, I, I see uh, hard-working families in Niles and Buchanan and this auto insurance cost to them is really it's pretty destructive to their personal budgets so I think there's some things we can do common sense reform uh, to maybe do some rate cap structure on the fees that uh, hospitals and doctors charge because right now you know Medicare regular insurance but if you're in a car accident there's just no limit. They're charged tremendous rates for the same MRI or whatever. There could be some reform there. There could be some fraud authority changes, um, some way to you know, get insurance companies to pay without being sued all the time. Uh, there's even one bill that's saying, well, let's give people a choice. Maybe they don't want that unlimited lifetime benefit. If they would opt for a lesser level of benefit, you could save them $100 a car. There's, there's different ideas out there, but I think there's just too much money being spent on car insurance in general in Michigan. And, and as a result, we've got a lot of uninsured drivers. Very true. I want to ask you your opinion. You guys are prov going back to the, the inmates. You're providing, there's education for them, this training. But is the fact that a lot of them probably have trauma and, and a lot of issues that really need deep-seated issues that need to be addressed are are there opportunities for these for these inmates to to ha have counselors and is that trauma piece being talked about going into our prisons is just heartbreaking um, uh, we're putting people in cages you know it's and when you walk through and see face to face and talk to these folks um, and there's no easy answers I walked into one gentleman's cell, he was 70, 72 years old, and he had some paintings in there that were just gorgeous, and I bought one from him, actually. And I said, well, when did you come in here? Oh, I was 20. And you look a guy in the eye, and he's you know, been there 52 years, and he did something stupid when he was a teenager. Uh, and he, he's not a danger to society anymore. He showed me pictures of his family that always come visit and things. And it's, there's so many complicated issues. Drug abuse, mental health. Uh, we have, you know, we closed down mental health facilities in the state for a number of years. Well, a lot of these folks have ended up in jail or prison. And that's not the best. 
Uh, there's gangs in prisons, and try to figure out how to reduce that. I mean, I, I, I know people in prison are just terrified because of gangs. Um, so it's, it's so challenging, and yet we've got good people working for, trying to make it better. Everything's expensive. Everything's on a budget. You know, people look at the Michigan State budget and they see so much going to corrections. Well, let's cut there. Maybe we can put more money in education. Well. Those, these folks are going to come back to society, most of them. Um, there are innovative programs. I walked through a prison, I think it was in Marquette, it was in the Upper Peninsula. All of a sudden, outdoors, I see all these gardens, and there's all these prisoners hoeing and weeding, and they're picking their vegetables. And I said, Yeah, we give each one a little square of a plot, and we give them tools. And these prisoners were taking all this pride in growing this produce, and then uh, they were donating it to a food uh, home, and so it could be spread to uh, needy families. You know, cool stuff. There's a lot of good stuff, and then there's just a lot of heartbreaking stuff. And I guess I have two more years to work and try to be a part of the solution. Let's talk about your commitment to investing in education. Well, I, I have thought, you know, we went through a period of time in Michigan where the depression was really bad. We kind of went through it double in Michigan with our car industry and funding for schools was cut. Um, uh, and some of it was probably appropriate where schools really had to tighten their belt and make some good changes. So I have struggled and, and pushed in, in my four years so far and I'll continue for two more so let's at least give schools a steady, small increase every year so they can count on, they're not gonna be cut next year. You know, we fund on a per student basis. So we're trying to give them $100, $150 or more per student per year so they can at least have some stability and grow their budgets. It'd be nice if we could make a bigger jump at some point. Um, something dragging down the whole system, the more money we put in, the retirement system for public school employees, we call it MEPSERS, is eating up most of the extra funds that we put in right now because you know, it's promises were made for uh, retirement benefits that uh, were not pre-funded enough. And so we're trying to get a hold of that, get ahead of the MEPSERS debt so more money that's going into education can go actually into the classroom eventually and not into this long-term debt and liability situation. So we're dealing with that. Um, tricky stuff, but we have been able to give schools some of this, this gradual increase in funding and they've appreciated that. And they know that the MEPSERS is a big part of the problem. We'll be looking for maybe some reform ideas next term also to help us get ahead of that even a little bit more. Municipalities in Michigan, the same problem with uh, post-employment benefits uh, have not been pre-funded, so these, these communities have, have these large unfunded debts on their books that are starting to come due as, as people retire. So challenges in being a legislature. I think you're doing great work. Well, we sure. try. <laughs> what else would you like to add? Um, I. I enjoy being a state rep. I wish our term limits were a little bit longer because in Michigan you can serve three two-year terms in the state house. So come January 1st, I'll be the most experienced rep in the building. I've been there four years. And there'll be this year's freshman class of how I have two years of experience and there'll be a brand new people who don't know where the bathrooms are. That's not a lot of experience. Uh, after I had been there two years, I was handed the corrections budget. I said, well, you're the corrections guy now. And the guy who did it before is gone. That's an awful lot of a learning curve to expect. I'd like to do, maybe do that for six or eight years and then hand it off to the next person. I don't think people should be lifetime politicians in state government, but this three, two-year term for the House of Representatives in Michigan is, is really too short. Um, it, there's a lack of institutional knowledge. I, I, I spread that word and people say, well, you're selfish, you wanna stay longer. No, I, if we make a change, don't make it for my class, make it for the next people coming in. But uh, I guess that's one message I keep spreading, but it's also a great privilege. It's 
to go into the house of the, the state capitol every day and do your job, that's, that's really cool. Tell us, lastly, what leadership means to you. What does it mean to be a leader? Well, I could go on on that for a long time. You have to I, say it in I, one sentence. I showed leadership in my personal life. I run a business for over 30 years now and raised a family. And, and, I, and I had respect from local boards I served on. When I, when I got elected to the school board, they elected me chairman the first meeting as a rookie. And then when I got elected to the county commissioners, they elected me chair. I had a reputation for being a good mediator, a good listener, a good leader. I, a leader sees whatever organization he's over, whether it's a church or a school, are we moving in, the entire unit is moving in the healthy direction. Are they healthy within themselves? We're not all fighting and we're accomplishing our goal. You know, as a church has certain purposes, are we moving in that direction? Or schools, are we making education better? The leader takes that big picture and then is able to work with different factions within to see that we're moving there. And he doesn't get too bogged down in all the details. And he learns his role as a school board president. I quickly had our school board learn our role. So we weren't meddling in on, well, who's going to be the next football coach? That's not the school board's role. We hire a superintendent. We oversee the budget. Uh, so a leader gets that big picture and works with different factions together. I'm good at that. When I go to Lansing, am I going to be a leader? No. There it's po politics. There the leader is who raised the most money, who made the most promises, who traveled around the state and got involved in all the other elections and made promises and got support and raised money and raised money. That's a little disappointing at that level that leadership is not based on what I would call leadership. Doesn't mean we haven't had some good people in leadership positions, but uh, it's politics when you get to that level overrules everything. And that's, that's just one of the downsides. But on the other hand, there's an awfully lot of good people up there. I've made some great friends, so good and the bad. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure. Appreciate it.